Welcome to this live recording of the Cynic Podcast from the Asia Society in New York, in conversation tonight with Mara Fistendahl. Hello, New York. <laughs> All right. The Cynic Podcast is a weekly discussion of current affairs in China produced in partnership with SubChina. SubChina is the best way to keep on top of all the latest news from China, especially by subscribing to SubChina Access with its daily email newsletter. It is a feast of business, political, and cultural news about a nation that is reshaping the world. I am Kaiser Guo, and tonight I am thrilled to be joined by Mara Hisdal for the launch of her fantastic, timely, important book, The Scientist and the Spy. Mara is a prolific writer covering lots of topics in science and technology. She's written for many, many major publications. She is also the author of Unnatural Selection, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and of And the City Swallowed Them, a wonderfully noirish novel-esque work of nonfiction crime, uh, which we talked about on Cynic together back when she was still living and reporting in China. She and her family now make their home in Minneapolis, and Mara continues to do fantastically good reporting on China-related topics, especially on the underreported, undercovered area of science. So uh, read her stuff. Mara, congratulations, first of all, on the book, which I just loved, I mean, immoderately. I loved this book. I read it twice. I highly recommend it to all uh, readers, and not just to the China-obsessed who tend to you know, read these things, but for really everyone. Give it as a press. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Immoderately. That's a, it's a great word. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do a lot of things in, in moderation. So, uh, Mara, the book centers on the story of Robert Mo, uh, Mo Hai Long, a PRC national who's living in the U.S. He's a, a church-going family man uh, with two children living in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, he ends up conducting agro-industrial espionage for his Chinese employer, DBN, in the cornfields of Iowa. I remember I first encountered this story uh, in the pages of the New York Times. I think it was in 2014. And uh, I think that's where you first ran into it, too. Mm -hmm. What was it about this story, about the story about Robert Moore, that got its hooks into you and made you decide this was a great topic for a book? So I was living in Shanghai at that time uh, when that story came out and you know, been reporting on science there for a number of years. And I often felt jealous of other cor foreign correspondents and felt like they had you know, the more exciting beat. Um, you know, I, I loved the stories I did. I got to you know, go to archaeological <coughs> digs and, and do lots of really exciting things. Uh, but you know, suddenly, my beat was in the news. And the headline of that article read, um, Designer Seed Targeted by Chinese, or something like that. And um, so it was about this man who had been found in a cornfield in Iowa um, that was operated by Monsanto. He was accused of stealing trade secrets from the company. And um, his appearance in the field had set off this massive FBI investigation involving car chases, surveillance planes, um, the use of a FISA warrant, which is normally reserved for extreme national security threats. And, um, you know, I just was hooked by those details. Yeah, I mean, and it is a fascinating story, as it turns out, and one that touches on just so many topics that have become all the more timely since 2014. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this was all happening still during the Obama administration, but um, it, things have really, really kind of taken off uh, in, in more recent years. So um, let's maybe quickly do uh, a rundown. We've talked a little bit about, about Robert Moore, but let's talk about some of the other major characters, the, the dramat dramatis personae of this book. Uh, one of them is a, an American uh, agronomist, I guess he is, uh, named Kevin Montgomery, who's retained by DBN uh, through the good offices of Robert Moore. Another is Mark Benton, who is in the FBI agent, who's really sort of the lead investigator of this. Can you talk about a little bit about those two? So when I set out to tell a story, I wanted to tell it from all sides and, and give a really close narration of what these different um, people were experiencing. So that meant going to the FBI and getting their account of what had happened. And um, because there were so many documents in the case, I also had you know, a play-by-play -play rundown of what the agents had said at various points, um, you know, even at the moment of arrest. 
um, what the dialogue was. And then um, about two years into my reporting, I was um, retracing Robert Moe's steps in, in the Midwest, and I was in Illinois uh, interviewing a farmer and you know, asking him, so did you have any contact with Robert? And, uh, and he's, no, 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 you know, it was always the American guy that we dealt with. And, hmm. and I was like, what American guy? <laughs> um, and, and so that was the point at which I learned that there was this Illinois farmer and agronomist who'd been caught in the middle of this whole operation. And he was working as a consultant for DBN, the Chinese seed company, and was really kind of the foreign face of the operation. Uh, so he had no knowledge of the um, more nefarious goings on. And then several months into his work for this company, the FBI shows up at his doorstep, uh, knocks on his door, uh, interrogates him, and then he becomes a very reluctant FBI informant. Right, right. And what yeah. about the investigator, Mark Benton? So I, I, maybe, maybe first, mm -hmm. before we get a, a couple of personality details about Kevin Montgomery, because he's, yeah. he's a character, right? Yeah, Kevin, I spent a lot of time with Kevin. It seems you uh, did. <laughs> he was, <laughs> it was almost like he was, he was waiting for me to show up. Uh, when I found him, because he because he had been a confidential source, he'd been sort of left out. Um, uh, the case did not even go to trial, so he wasn't able to testify. And so he was really ready to uh, give me his whole story. And um, he had visibility into all sides because he'd been dealing with the FBI throughout, but he had also um, gone to Beijing to visit the headquarters of DBN. Um, he'd had very frequent contact with Robert, so he gave me all the emails that they exchanged and so forth. And, and he also had this sort of scientist's uh, precision in the way that he described things that was very interesting for me as a writer. When it wasn't putting you right to sleep. Yeah, yeah at, times, right. at times, <laughs> it was, it was, times it was putting me to sleep. About hybridized yeah. corn yeah. Uh, in breeding, it was pretty yeah. complicated stuff. Uh, he, he also he, had a, an interesting uh, method of learning Mandarin Chinese, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. He um, he saved fortune cookies <laughs> whenever he went out to eat in Illinois, in southern Illinois, and he would keep the fortunes. And then you know when it says on the back, learn Chinese, he would log the phrases into an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had these. <laughs> he actually sent me these words. You know, it was like banana, um, <laughs> corn. And and then you know all those kind of cheesy <coughs> phrases that are that you see on fortune cookies. That's terrific. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Mark Benton from the FBI. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we know about him? What should we, as a reader, know about this guy? He, Mark Benton, was the lead FBI agent on the case. Uh, he is, he was you know, from Nebraska, former Marine, um, ended up working in the Des Moines field office. Uh, where he was tasked with all sorts of cases. Um, and, and then, you know, to develop these cases, the FBI actually works very closely with corporations. So the agents will make these visits to their friends in corporate security <laughs> at various companies. Um, so one day, he goes out to the offices of DuPont Pioneer, which is um, a major, was a major seed company in, in the United States. It's now, it's now Dow DuPont. Um, Just as Monsanto is now part of Bayer. Right? It's, that's right, right. So he learns of theft in cornfields from a corporate security officer um, at DuPont Pioneer. Um, starts looking into it, then he finds that there's this other incident involving a Monsanto cornfield. So now you have two incidents. Um, and then, you know, that, that's a case. And so he ends up leading uh, over 70 agents around the country in multiple states. Um, there's an airport bust. Um, there's a scene where a woman is pulled away from her children. Robert Moore's also, wife. another airport, right. but that's a second airport bus. Right. Uh, yeah, Robert Moore's sister, actually. Oh, sister, right. That's right, his sister, right. And... He's married uh, to the dramatic. CEO of, of DBN. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. There's a there was an instance where <coughs> Robert Moe was trying to ship 
some of the corn seed back to China via FedEx. He's <coughs> shipping it to Hong Kong via FedEx. And the FBI intercepted the seed and then got this idea to replace it with decoy seed. In order to, in order to make sure that the decoy seed was believable, they felt that they had to get it from the same company. So Mark Benton drives out to DuPont Pioneer, which is like you know an hour drive, 45 minute drive, with the sirens blazing, yeah. picks up the seed. Because he's under the gun. Drives under the gun. Right. <laughs> drives back to the Des Moines airport, and an FBI pilot is waiting there. He puts the seed onto the aircraft, and then the, the, the FBI pilot jets it to a FedEx in Chicago so that they can switch out the seed in time for it to get to Hong Kong on schedule. Your tax dollars at work. <laughs> <laughs> Now, <laughs> um, the book is, as I mentioned, called The Scientist and the Spy. I, I want to talk a little bit about this title because I had a couple of, of different theories about what it actually meant. One was maybe sort of on the surface that the scientist refers to, to um, Kevin Montgomery and the spy to Robert Moore. Another was the idea that maybe these are two personalities that the one individual at the center of the book, Robert, uh, uh, inhabits, that he is both a scientist and a spy. Mm -hmm. uh, another is maybe just two notional ideas, these maybe archetypes of a, a scientist and a spy that uh, combine in different forms in, 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 in this book. What, what did you in, intend, with, or did you intend ambiguity? I intended it to be ambiguous. Oh, okay, and I, so you and I, worked. I liked the alliteration. And, um, but you know, also, we're at a point where many ethnic Chinese scientists have uh, been cast in this role of spies or suspected spies, um, where it's become a very fraught issue and uh, where the line is not quite clear. And, and you know, you do, there are a number of cases, which I go into in the book, where people were charged with very serious offenses and then later turned out to be innocent. Um, in the book, you know, at some point, Kevin the, the FBI was very suspicious of Kevin Montgomery, right. this um, white guy from Illinois as well, who, who was a scientist who kind of found himself in this, in this awkward role of a potential spy. Doubtless using fortune cookies as dead drops. <laughs> That's right. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, which is, is interesting. I mean, the, the, on the, the subject of, before we get into profiling, which is what I really want to talk about a, a lot, let's talk about what they actually are accused of having done this is Robert and his Confederates, including mm -hmm. Dr. Li Xiaoming and, mm -hmm. and some of the others whose cars were bugged. And in fact, Robert was not the only person indicted in this case. There were, I think, no. six or seven, right? Yeah, six. The, mm -hmm. the six, six people who were actually indicted, and it was only Robert who ever ended up being, right. being taken. The, the rest are on the FBI's most wanted most list. Most wanted list, right. Still. What are they accused of having? Yeah, because these guys right up there with you know the, the major terrorist figures. And, I mean, who knows? A drone strike might be in in order. Right? I, I uh, love your editorializing. So, no, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's let's talk about what they were actually accused of having done. Mm -hmm. um, why did they want to to take this hybridized seed corn into a country where, as far as I understand it, genetically modified organisms of any kind are not are are, are not even available on the market. You can't sell them. Yeah, so, so GM corn has not been legalized in China yet, but the expectation is that it will be in a few years. And people in China are eating higher and higher up the food chain. You know, their, their diet looks more like the diet of Americans. Um, thankfully, not entirely like the diet of Americans yet, but um, that, you know, in order to produce that meat, you need animal feed, which often comes from corn. So China has this very large population, relatively little arable land, and the solution that the government favors and that you know, many companies see has business potential is to come up with better seed lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, that makes sense. So, so they're actually just accused of having done what? They, they've stolen these seeds, and the idea is that they'll be able to do what with them? produce viable lines just from seed that they find scattered on left over from the harvest? So I don't want to bore everybody by getting into how you get hybrid seed, but you need 
two parent lines, mm -hmm. and so the idea was by stealing all of these parent lines of seed that they could reverse engineer um, the hybrid seed lines. And so, so kind of sidestep years of research. Right, right, right. It, it's interesting that you chose this case, uh, which is one where it's unequivocal that, that what Robert Moore did was intellectual property theft, that it was a case of industrial espionage. But the point that you really seem to want to illustrate with his story is one about profiling and about overreach and, and about uh, sort of excessive uh, zeal in mm -hmm. pursuing a case like this, which, which was interesting. Of course, all this is taking place across a backdrop where uh, I, I read recently that uh, in a period from about 2000 to 2010, this was in Bloomberg, uh, of people applying for clearance, for, for clearance with the Department of Defense scientists, uh, about 44% of them were rejected, and that, is, that was across all different ethnicities. It was pretty consistent across all different ethnicities. But in the years between 2010 and just October of last year, that number had jumped to over 60% uh, who were being denied when they were of Chinese ethnic background, but had fallen to 30-odd percent when it was uh, people of other ethnicities. So mm -hmm. clearly there's been a, a spike in, in that. Now, um, obviously the FBI or other law enforcement agencies should not be expected to sit on their hands as American industrial secrets are being stolen uh, by any people of, of any country. Uh, but obviously, you know, the cure here seems to be, I think this is, this is really the point of your book, is that it's worse than the actual disease that it's intended to treat. So, so let's start with something that, that um, I, I just mentioned, the foundational assumptions that I think um, inform the, the FBI in how they approach these, these sorts of cases. These, uh, you, you trace back actually to a, a report that was written in the 1990s, let me see if I think that's his name, uh, an FBI agent named Paul Moore, mm -hmm. uh, who talked about uh, a theory called the grains of sand theory. Can you lay that out, grains of sand, and, and what impact it had mm -hmm. and, and how it, it has uh, affected American law enforcement's thinking? Sure. Um, so when I started reporting this book, I was agnostic about what I was going to find. You know, I did not set out with a specific agenda. Uh, I did at some point realize I was going to need to understand how um, the FBI has conceptualized spying from China over the years and how industrial espionage fits into that. And when I read about the thousand grains of sand theory, you know, I was a little bit dumbstruck. Like, it just struck me as kind of an idiotic way to conceptualize something. <laughs> um, the, the idea is, it dates back to the mid-1990s, and it is that if if intelligence collection is aimed at determining the composition of sand on the beach, the U.S. and Russia would send in these like, dedicated spies um, to you know, test the sand, pay people for secrets about the sand, and do all of these things, so, like traditional James Bond type means. And China, on the other hand, would send 10,000 people to go lie on the beach, and each of them would take one grain of sand back, <laughs> and, and through this kind of open collection, by, by ethnic Chinese, that is what the theory says, they would somehow assemble these grains of sand into a whole. And there are a number of problems with this theory, which I have been pointed out by others. Um, you know, one is that it's, it was never, never clear exactly how they would be assembled into a whole. You know, the other very obvious problem is that, you know, this is, there's a long line of um, conceptualizing um, ye yellow peril, hordes overwhelming our border, and this theory blue uh, ants, evokes, right. yeah, blue ants from the Mao era, um, you know, there was this idea that uh, the Chinese all wore these kind of drab costumes, um, sorry, drab Mao suits, um, and that they look like ants. And so this theory is kind of straight out of that line, um, going back to the late 1800s. And this 
still has traction within some intelligence agencies. Um, there's also a very real risk that it could lead us astray so that A, people could be arrested who are innocent, but also that you could miss problems that we should be addressing, mm. that you miss cases um, like, you know, for example, Charles Lieber. He, he was not charged with espionage. But, Charles Lieber yeah. is the, uh, the very prominent Harvard chemist who was mm -hmm. recently arrested February uh, on January 28th, accused of having taken uh, quite a bit of money mm -hmm. from China's Thousand Talents, bro, which has nothing to do with the thousand grains of sand, by the way. No, it's true. It's, it's true. <laughs> right. So he and he's he was not accused of economic espionage, but you know that's an example of a case that would have been missed using that framework. Yeah, uh, it, it reminds me of that theory about um, the fifty cent army. This idea that uh, internet commentators in China are each somehow the millions of them are each paid uh, fifty Chinese cents per pro-party post that they, I mean, mm -hmm. as though any government could possibly mount that kind of, and this yeah. thousand grains of sand idea also seems to me to be sort of the direct progenitor of the, the, the this idea that Christopher Ray, our current FBI director, though he's, I don't know how long he's going to be in office, he's already come in for, uh, mm -hmm. he w talked about in, in a, a, before the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, how this whole of society threat from China requires a whole of society response from the United mm -hmm. States, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it just seems to be quite directly related. Um, so let, let's talk about how this has played out how in, in profiling. It struck me that there was quite a range of awareness among the people that you talked to about the dangers of profiling. Some of them were, were very much aware. For example, the judge uh, mm -hmm. who eventually hears Robert Moore's case, and maybe you can talk about her a little bit. But others who were very cavalier, um, what were some of the most egregious examples that you came across in researching this book of actual instances of, of ethnic or racial profiling? Uh, well, soon after I started reporting on the Robert Mo case, um, Xiao Xingxi was arrested at gunpoint outside of Philadelphia. So he was the interim chair of the physics department at, at, Tem Temple, yeah. at Temple University. Um, he was charged with wire fraud for allegedly transferring um, tr transferring technology to China. Um, the charges were very quickly dropped in that case, and it became clear that the that the government did not check the science behind the charges. Mm. And there were, there were a number of these cases that were brought over the course of my reporting. And the book is primarily this um, kind of thriller style retelling of the Robert Moe case, but I tried to interweave these cases into that because they happened over the same time period, they were informing that case, and um, the issue became so fraught that by the time uh, Robert Moe was close to going to trial, the judge did uh, rule that his ethnicity could not be brought up at trial. It, he didn't end yeah. up going to trial, just to be clear. He but, did not, right, right. Um, but there was so much the uh, there's so much discovery in the case, and there was so much in you know, a back and forth um, between the two sides ahead of trial that I learned quite a lot about the case. And, and it went on for two years. The judge decided yeah. that in discovery, the prosecution was not supposed to take into account Robert's actual ethnicity. Right? If it did go to trial, right. there was were no, they were not supposed to mention his ethnicity. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, I, I remember there was another uh, case, I mean, maybe it isn't direct profiling, mm -hmm. but Mark Benton himself attached an affidavit to uh, a warrant application. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, it wasn't the FISA yeah. warrant application, but we, those mm -hmm. are, 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 are still kept secret. But, right. uh, and he actually lists as one of the pieces of probable cause that Robert spoke Mandarin Chinese with his interlocutors in China. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which strikes me as a, a, a rather strange case to make. Yeah, there was a woman in the case who was a suspected insider who worked for a, one of the um, a seed company that sells um, seed genetics to DuPont Pioneer and Monsanto. And the, it appears that the FBI investigated her um, because she was frequently on the phone with Robert Mo and speaking Chinese, as was cited in the warrant. Um, so when I, 
when I met with uh, Robert in prison, uh, he told me that, you know, I asked him, like, what are you going to do? You're, you're going to get out in a few years and you'll go back to China because he, he's now in deportation. He, mm. he, he will be deported. And, you know, what, what are you going to do with your life after this? And, and he said, oh, I'm not worried. I'm going to go back to China and write a book called Catch That Chinese Spy. <laughs> so, so your book yeah. actually brings up a number, a, a bunch of them. We talked about Xiao Xingxi at Temple University, but there's also Sherry Chen at the National mm-hmm. Weather Service, mm-hmm. uh, and then of course the most famous, probably, case from the 1990s of the Los Alamos uh, nuclear. He wasn't a, a physicist; he was actually an engineer mm-hmm. uh, named Wen Ho Li, who's not actually uh, a PRC national at all. I mean, he was uh, he's Taiwanese. Is that correct? Maybe. Uh, w- these are, are people for whom uh, ultimately the cases were dropped. There was not sufficient evidence in Xiao Xingxi's case, in Sherry Chen's case, in the, the sort of archetype of all of them, Wen Ho Li, or even the one that goes back further, mm-hmm. uh, the rocket scientist Chen Xue Shen. Uh, Chen Xue Shen, maybe we can leave him out of it, but h- how do you draw a connection between these and a Robert Moe case in which he actually did commit mm-hmm. crimes? It's quite clear. He pleads guilty yeah. and there's unequivocal evidence. Robert Moe's case has happened over a period when there has been a rapid increase in these prosecutions brought. So dozens of cases involving um, scientists accused of stealing trade secrets theft, sorry, accused of stealing trade secrets from China over the past 10 years. Um, So by looking at that case, I was able to raise the question of whether the punishment is commensurate with the crime. And one thing I learned from talking about talking with um, people like Kevin Montgomery and, and farmers uh, throughout the Midwest when I was doing my reporting is that um, the, the major thing that they're concerned about in terms of innovation and competitiveness in the industry is rapid corporate consolidation in the industry. So they're not, I mean, trade secrets theft from China is an issue, uh, but they're actually heavily dependent on China for purchasing their corn. Mm-hmm. And you know, as we've seen with the trade war, these people have been heavily impacted um, by the tariffs. And um, the, 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 one of the major um, uh, issues impacting their life is the fact that the number of seed companies have, have just declined from dozens years ago to four major ones today. And, and the impact of those companies um, consolidating um, has been massive. You know, prices have gone up. Um, the companies spend less and less on research. And the U.S. government spent untold amount, amounts of money defending um, Monsanto. But by the end of my reporting and the end of my book, Monsanto was no longer even an American company. Um, so it does raise a question of w- whether this is, is where we should be spending our tax dollars. And how do you answer that question? <laughs> well, I think there are a lot of other things that we can do to promote competitiveness. Um, you mentioned the, these historical cases and concerns about racial profiling. Um, you know, definitely we should find ways to combat trade secret stuff from China, but also consider the fact that this is a sizable swath of our research force. And many, many scientists I talk to now feel scared. They feel like they're targeted and they feel like um, they're not welcome here. And like PhD students are talking to them and saying they're going to go to other countries. Um, And so, you know, we should find ways to make these people feel welcome here. Um, also find ways to, um, re, you know, to break up monopolies in industries, um, to make those industries more competitive. Um, at the time, shortly after uh, Robert Moe was uh, first investigated, the Justice Department actually took on an, or considered taking on an anti- antitrust suit against Monsanto. <laughs> and, um, you know, there was concern about about the company's licensing practices and this feeling um, like the, the company had become inherently anti-competitive. And that was dropped over the course of this case. And then you had another arm of the Justice Department take on this case in which um, Monsanto was the victim company 
and the government is basically assuming its legal fees. Unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's a hard sell, I think, to a lot of our allies when we try to convince them, as we did during the Obama administration, that industrial espionage is a, is a no-no, absolutely bad. Mm -hmm. We cannot let the Chinese steal our trade secrets. If they go after the Office of Personnel Management and manage to steal a, a whole trove of, of personnel files, as they did, that's somehow fair play. Uh, that's what governments do. I think, I don't remember who it was, but I think it might have been the then direct, uh, FBI director who, who said, said as much. I, I certainly heard a couple of Pentagon officials mm -hmm. say the same, that, that going after uh, hacking Pentagon websites, DOD uh, properties online, that is okay. We do that to them, they do that to us. But it's not okay if they go after uh, in the industrial targets. Yeah. Yeah, it's because, just, I mean, that, of course, it goes at the heart of American capitalism. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing to me. Uh, yeah, did, that, did, did, did people reckon with this as you were talking to them? It, and that is a stance that we've carved out, the U.S. government has carved out over the past 10 years. Um, you know, I did do a lot of reporting on how this, this became a crime and uh, why we started uh, bringing these cases in the first place. Um, the obvious reason and the reason we hear about in the news all the time is that there, there is more industrial espionage from China. But there is this other reason, um, which is that going back to the end of the Cold War, uh, when you know suddenly we no longer had this major adversary, uh, there was a kind of search within the intelligence agencies for a new mission and a new focus. You know, at the same time you had the dawn of the internet, so it became a lot easier to steal trade secrets uh, from, you know, companies could go after each other without even crossing borders. And so the Economic Espionage Act was passed in that wake, and it became, um, it only became a, a federal crime to steal trade secrets in 1996. And you know, initially, the one big concern was France. Um, Israel was <laughs> was another sure. target country early early on, uh, but it's only in the past in the past uh, decade that we've seen all these cases brought involving China. Hmm. Interesting. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I think it's been kind of a hard sell is that while we were making this noise. Uh, certain revelations came out, especially the revelations of Edward Snowden, and it became clear that we had been spying on Dilma Rousseff, that, you know, who was then the, the president of Brazil, that we had been spying, in fact, on Angela Merkel, uh, mm -hmm. which I, I can see how that would be slightly problematic. Mm -hmm. In the case of Robert Moe, was it even alleged that there had been state involvement in DBN's efforts to steal hybridized seed grain from the United States? Or from Monsanto or from no. Pioneer? No. Um, the FBI really wanted to find that. We see from early warrant applications that they were really hoping to find a government connection. Um, you know, in most of these cases, definitely in Robert Moe's case and in many other cases, it's, it's not that overt. You know, there's priorities set by the Chinese government to develop certain areas of technology. And it's not that they're actually, in most cases, sending out spies to go and steal these technologies. But companies know that there won't be big penalties if they are able to attain the technologies. And, and so you have a kind of like a lot of low-level hustlers and companies that, you know, for, for the same reasons that, um, that U.S. companies steal each other's trade secrets, um, find it's easier to get ahead. Uh, by taking the technology than by doing the work themselves. Do uh, American law enforcement agencies tend to go after American companies who were accused of intellectual property theft against other American companies as aggressively, do they put as many resources into it as they would uh, in a case like this? I know the Economic Espionage Act is primarily used for foreign foreign companies and in individuals stealing from American companies. So when uh, I think it was Waymo mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and, and Uber, had, or Google, I'm sorry, had yeah. their little falling out, was the Department of Justice even involved in, in a significant So that was a way? case involving self-driving cars. Technology, right. 
I believe that was a civil case. Okay. Yeah, so normally the companies would pay their own legal fees and they would go to court, one would sue the other. In this case, in the, in the case of Robert Moe, you had the, the federal government um, taking on legal costs on behalf of Monsanto and DuPont Pioneer. And um, so, you know, kind of putting a, a much greater priority on this case. Uh, while he is being investigated, I think it's after, only after he's actually arrested, uh, Robert Moe discovers uh, a lump near his groin on his mm -hmm. leg, uh, which he's initially told is just a, a benign lipoma, mm -hmm. but later on proves to be a cancer, a right. fairly rare form of cancer, right. which he has treated, interestingly, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in, mm -hmm. in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. You went on to do uh, a story. You worked actually with uh, a, a Chronicle, Houston Chronicle reporter named Todd Ackerman on a story about MD Anderson in a different context. Right. Can you talk about what happened at MD Anderson and the uh, cases that you, I think, conclude are a racial profiling of Chinese cancer researchers mm -hmm. at that center? So I was trying to tell this book scene by scene, um, you know, with these alternating perspectives. On, and so Robert develops cancer while he's um, under house arrest awaiting trial. And, and because he pursued, um, he, the, the judge allowed him to go to Texas to get treatment at MD Anderson. And then when I saw this center kind of crop up in the national spotlight, um, sources told me that this was happening um, because I was the reporter who, who broke that story. Um, you know, I got very interested in, in what was going on there. Um, what happened was the FBI, working together with the National Institutes of Health, uh, started cracking down on incidents of grant fraud involving China. And so at MD Anderson, they ran this 18-month investigation and put, um, I think, around a dozen ethnic Chinese researchers on leave. That meant that they did not have access to their email. They couldn't go back to their labs. You know, they were kind of ostracized from their work lives um, while the FBI was investigating th these issues of grant fraud. So in the end, nobody was charged. Um, the MD Anderson did um, push some people out. Some people left on their own. Um, you had this kind of mass exodus and a climate of complete fear. So I, when I went to Texas to do this story, the institution um, got concerned th that the story was going to come out. They decided to pass all these documents on the investigations that they had done to this reporter at the Houston Chronicle, Todd Ackerman. Um, so my editor was like, go contact Todd and see if you can team up. And Todd was like, okay, like, I don't want to spend my whole, <laughs> you know, I don't want to spend the next two days learning what China's Thousand Talents program is. So um, he was very, he was, he was happy to team up. And we did this story together. And um, it, you know, I, I, I still wish, I still have a lot of unanswered questions mm -hmm. about what happened there. There seems to have been some impropriety, right? There were people who, for mm -hmm. example, shared grant applications, uh, templates that they weren't supposed mm -hmm. to share, or actual samples yeah. of grant applications. But it doesn't seem to have risen to a level, of maybe technically, yeah, grant fraud, mm -hmm. uh, but not espionage, as, and not, not anything that quite nefarious, no? Well, so in the past two years, you've seen this shift of, um, th there are still these cases involving corporations being brought, but there are also many cases involving <coughs> universities and research centers, and MD Anderson's actually not the only cancer center um, where these cases have been brought. The and, NIH actually yeah. has been quite aggressive about going after these. They, they, yeah. They've given lists to a lot of universities mm -hmm. and a lot of research institutions, right? Yeah, and I think part of it is that there, the you know, under the Trump uh, DOJ, there's been this. Um, they they introduced something called the China Initiative, and there's been an increased emphasis on going after trade secrets theft. Um, there, the it was this like open secret that 
a lot of researchers were double dipping on an NIH grant money. So that meant that they were getting funding from the NIH, and then they were also getting these posts in China. When I was a science reporter in China, we primarily uh, reported on it from the perspective of like all this. The ten thousand talents pro or the thousand talents program was mm -hmm. was. A colossal. Well, a lot of people didn't show up. So they would take money from China, they would take money from the U.S. government, um, and there were lists circulating of who was doing this. And it, so my guess is that for the FBI, it's a kind of low-hanging fruit. Right. Uh, it's an easy way to um, you know, show that they are making progress on this issue of, of IP leaking out. I mean, the problem is that it's not clear in how many of these cases people actually were taking technology. Hmm. The other problem is you know, universities are less welcoming of having the FBI on campus. Right. And um, you know, many of these researchers are doing basic research. And they're important to the U.S. innovation complex. And they make up a sizable part of our research force. And so you know, these are all issues that are going to continue to play out. Just before uh, we recorded, we were chatting with Orville downstairs, and he uh, <coughs> made, a, a, I think, a pretty astute observation. He said that for a lot of these Chinese universities, or for, for the Chinese government, it, it's not that they actually expect that the Charles Liebers of the world, these prominent scientists, are going to come to Wuhan University of Technology, as, as he was supposed to, and spend nine months there and produce a lot of, of, of quality research. It's like buying a Gucci handbag, he said. You want the brand. You want you know, be able to say, I've got a Harvard guy, I've got two Columbia guys, mm -hmm. I've got a, a guy from MD Anderson, right? Yeah, and they did set up a like, Harvard, a Harvard Institute, Institute right. in Wuhan. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Hey, so, so Mara, do you have a passage of the book that, I mean, we could take a couple of minutes and, and read, just to give, yeah. a, I think people probably want a flavor of the prose, which I think is just marvelous. Uh, do you have a se selection that you might be able to read for us? So I can, um, this is see. the part we can cut out of the, I mean, it'll seem seamless in the actual podcast, right? <laughs> no, no sound of pages flipping. Okay. I'm going to need to get a drink of water. If we're going to edit. not have that in the podcast either. <laughs> so this is from airport bus number two. There are two airport busts, multiple car chases, and uh, all right. This is in the summer of 2014. In the basement of Los Angeles International Airport's Terminal 2, Mark Benton gathered law enforcement officers to explain the arrests they were about to carry out. Mark and his team had a dilemma. They had to figure out what to do with the kids. The week before, Moyun had arrived in Los Angeles with her two children. Because she had overseen a division at DBN and was married to the company's CEO, Mark had designated her as a person of interest in the case. When she passed through customs on her way into the country, her name triggered an alert. Um, CBP officers notified Mark of Moyun's arrival, and he had digital forensic specialists search images of Robert's devices for evidence that might implicate her. On a hard drive seized from DBN's Boca Raton office, the FBI found copies of MSN chat conversations between Robert and DBN staff in Beijing, extending all the way back to 2007, to the inception of the seed operation. Someone, presumably Robert, had cut and pasted the conversations into Word and text documents. Several of the chats were with Mo Moyun. That might be enough on which to hang an indictment, Mark believed. He hightailed it to Los Angeles, arriving in time for Moyun's return flight to Beijing. Mark had a warrant for Moyun's arrest, but he wanted to first see if she might offer some useful or incriminating information in a casual encounter. FBI agents could freely question people as long as the people agreed. If suspects declined or seemed unwilling to talk, Agents were required to read them their Miranda rights. Reciting those rights tended to make people close off. You have the right to remain silent. And often, they would. So Mark again planned to work through the CBP. 
Border Patrol agents not only had significant leeway with searches, they could also question foreign nationals at will. Around noon, Moyun and her kids arrived at the airport, checked their three suitcases, and cleared security. They walked to the gate area, bags of souvenirs dangling from their arms. When they arrived, almost every chair was occupied. People lounged on the floor with their phones plugged into outlets, charging them before their long haul. The terminal was under renovation, and its cheap carpeting and low ceilings gave it the feel of a developing world airport, plopped into America's second largest city. Moyun stopped at a bland Hudson News to buy snacks, and the line snaked around the register. Agents watched as she paid and returned to the gate with her kids. Then, as she moved toward a pair of open seats, CBP agent Jerome Esguera approached her. We need to ask you some questions about your visa application, he said. I'll, I'll stop there. Oh. You, can, you, can, you can guess where it's going. Yeah. <laughs> not, um... Mara, Mara Fistendahl, congratulations once again on just a fantastically compelling book. Uh, let's move on to recommendations, uh, as we do okay. each week on the show. Uh, what do you have for us this week? I'm going to recommend Thread of the Silkworm by Iris Chang. Um, it's a book that I used as source material in my own research, and uh, it was written in the 1990s, uh, but it's still relevant today. It's about a, it's about a scientist, Chen Shui-sun, who uh, was investigated for being a Communist Party member. Uh, in Which the 1950s. he was. In the, yeah, it recently came out that he actually was a Communist Party member, but he was driven back to China, where he ended up playing a major role in the weapons program, uh, the space program, and in some ways setting in motion the surveillance state. Hmm, yeah, it's, so, uh, he's fascinating. Yeah. He actually interviewed um, Tian Jason's granddaughter, Sarah Chen. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Was, uh, I visited his house in, in Beijing. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Uh, that's it. Iris Chang, of course, was the author of The Rape of Nanking, among other mm -hmm. books, and uh, she tragically committed suicide. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, really, really uh, a, a terrible loss. Um, my recommendation is, uh, uh, people who've been listening to the show know that I've been sort of on a tear reading through all the, uh, the sort of doom and gloom, death of democracy books. Uh, one that I had <laughs> recommended a couple of weeks ago was uh, The Light That Failed, which I just thought was terrific. Uh, this one, I like quite as much, but I'm still going to give it an emphatic recommendation. It's called How Democracies Die by Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt. Uh, I would still say, yeah, I mean, I think that, that The Light That Failed is the more um, thought-provoking, ultimately. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, you know, I think what, there's, there's you know, a, a lot of books in this genre. Uh, I, you know, Madeleine Albright has a book on that. I mean, there's a, a lot of them um, in this sort of post-Trump Brexit, Orban, Putin, uh, Erdogan age that we live in, but uh, check this one out. It's it's very good. Mm -hmm. uh, Mara, thank you so much for 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 inviting me to uh, to to be uh, here in New York with you to, on to celebrate the launch of your book, folks. Oh, don't forget to, to pick up your signed copies. Let's have a warm round of applause for Mara. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for having me. Hey, yeah. So, yeah. I'm gonna, as I promised, I'm going to turn this off. And don't forget, so we have microphones, a couple of microphones. Um, so please raise your hand and make sure to tell people who you are and uh, if you've got questions. We have this gentleman right here, uh, second, third row from the back. Nice and loud and into the mic. Sure. Um, I'm Brian Asinja. I go by Asinja, and I'm an African entrepreneur. Um, I'm just curious, since you happen to have painted a clear picture of what the U.S. stance is or what their fears are, uh, could you say a little bit more on what China's perspective is mm -hmm. on this whole issue? Um, are they also aggressively pursuing? Do they have defensive measures? Or, you know, just uh -huh. a little bit more on the other side. Thank yeah. you. Um. Well, it's complicated. <laughs> so, I mean, China has made a lot of improvements in its intellectual property regime over the past few years. Um, but one of the things that makes us so complex is 
that every action here creates this reaction there. So when there are cases involving profiling, like the case of uh, Xiao Xingxi, who was arrested um, and then charges were dropped, that that has led to a lot of press in China. Like Chinese press covers those cases um, very closely and are like, eager to leap on any incidents of racial profiling. Um, China, the Chinese government also launched its own uh, National Security Education Day a few years ago, where it had posters up um, around Beijing saying, um, like, beware of this foreigner, he could be a spy. There's a great little cartoon series, right? <laughs> yes. Do you guys remember yeah. this? This little cartoon series talking about this, you know, kind of, um, what, was the, what was his name? I can't even remember. It's like, you know, David, yeah, that way. Um, you know, this American English yeah. teacher who yeah. is a kind of a Lothario, right? You, you mm -hmm. end up hanging out too much with David, and yeah, next you thing you know. He's, you think he's a professor, but then. Right. Yeah. He's waltzing off with state secrets mm -hmm. that you. Right. So, uh, Right. So, um, you know, in some ways it's, it becomes a reflection of our own policies. Um, but, you know, the, it, part of what makes it so complicated is that the Chinese government um, <coughs> does have this influence campaign and has made a concerted effort um, to glean technology um, from various countries around the world, including the United States. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Next question. Surely somebody's got a question from our over here. This gentleman, okay, this gentleman right here. I'm, I'm. Hello. Hold you, grab the mic, and uh, you don't need to. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a longtime admirer of Mara's writing. And um, my question is uh, uh, not what exactly way. did the seed corn do to make better corn? Did it protect it from parasites? Did it make it uh, more sturdy against uh, weather? Did it make it breed more quickly? What, what was the advantage of this seed they were supposedly stealing? Well, so we actually don't know. Because it was a trade secret, it was it, it, the, I am totally serious. The identity of the corn seed lines was protected throughout the court proceedings. That was a whole other, it took, Monsanto and DuPont a year to work out how these seed lines were going to be protected because they were both companies were so afraid that the other would would get its own trade secrets in the pro, in the process. You know, so they were more afraid of each other than they were of DBN in a way. <laughs> and um, that comes out in discovery, but right? It it does make it <laughs> um Robert Moe told me at some point, this is a case of the emperor's new clothes because I can't even see what I'm being accused mm -hmm. of stealing. I mean, he, he, had, he, had, he had a taste for um, kind of overwrought metaphor. But, um, <laughs> you know, but I, I think he had a point in, in, in that one regard. I, I can tell you what it actually, it, it was just Roundup ready, right? I mean, it was just, <laughs> I'm sure it was. It was just because you know, glycophosphates yeah. are used mm -hmm. in, all weed killers around mm -hmm. the world right now, and um, most of what Monsanto was doing was was just having strains of corn that would be increasingly resistant to glycophosphate uh, weed killer. Mm -hmm. I think I just leaked a major <laughs> trade. You could be this prosecuted. This woman yeah. here. You read a book. Hi, my name is Natalia, also a fan, um, and I was lucky to read your book already. Everyone should get it. Um, it's very good. And one of the things I, I found really interesting is you mentioned the different um, relationship between like the federal government and China and Iowa and China. And given that Iowa is a lot of people's minds right now, I was wondering if you yeah. could expand a little bit on that. Yeah, is there news? Anyone have <laughs> their phone on? I don't have my phone. Did Pete pull it up? Um, so, one scene in the book um, happens when Xi Jinping, right before he actually became, uh, so back when he was vice president, before he became leader, um, traveled to Des Moines to give a speech at the World Food Prize building there. And so you had agricultural leaders from both sides 
um, they inked, or agricultural ministers, um, they inked this deal to, uh, for China to buy you know, massive amounts of um, soy and corn from Iowa. Everybody was very happy about it. Um, Robert Moe was sitting in the audience, and the FBI was waiting outside because they were tailing him everywhere he went and you know, like aroused a lot of suspicion that he was there the day that Xi Jinping visited. Um, <laughs> so, and so um, this relationship is so complex because many people in Iowa were making a lot of money <coughs> off of um, uh, Chinese purchases of agricultural products. And many people have been hurt um, by the trade war and the resulting tariffs. And in, in a way, they've been hurt more by that than they were by agricultural espionage. Um, Xi Jinping was actually um, Mo Hailong's handler, I think. <laughs> that is a total rumor. Right. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> All right, there's a gentleman right here with his hand up. Um, my name is Nitai Daitel of uh, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Um, I was thinking a lot through this, through your talk about the amazing piece uh, in SubChina last month, and this is not a paid plug, of Cheng Yang Yang's a piece on science in China and talking a lot about um, your musings on bioethics, specifically the He Jianhui case. And I was wondering about your thoughts and your years now covering the, the science beat in China and uh, conversations about um, you know, the, the Wild East and, and um, you know, the way, you know, the perception of China playing fast and loose with all these newfangled tools, you know, CRISPR and the like. Um, but in this sense, there is um, an element of um, anything goes because both sides are doing it, in, but when it's not suiting. And so I was just wondering what your thoughts, um, if you've seen the piece and in general on, on how bioethics plays in. Yeah. Before you just uh, a little context, and this is a paid plug. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Yang Chung, <laughs> Chung is a particle physicist who happens also to be a columnist for uh, for Sub China, and uh, you should definitely read her stuff. It's really great. Uh, and the the gentleman that he mentioned, He Jianhui, was the uh, Chinese uh, scientist who supposedly cloned, or I'm sorry, uh, genetically modified using CRISPR Cas9 uh, the embryos of twin baby girls mm -hmm. to give them supposed immunity from AIDS. Mm -hmm. So Yang actually um, provided really helpful comments on an early draft of the book. Um, it's been amazing to watch her work. Like when she first started writing, I was like, who is this woman who's writing about Chinese science and studying doing it so, so well? Um, and uh, I, I did not read that specific piece, uh, but I know the idea that you're getting at. And it's been... Um, it's been very strange to watch this beat of mine turn into this issue of um, uh, geopolitical tension, uh, but in a way, that's what's happening in all uh, in all areas of U.S.-China relations um, right now. Uh, you know, I I do think um, you know I got in my time in China, I got to know a lot of um, researchers who are doing really good work. Um, there, are, you know, even even people at the Chinese CDC, which is now in the spotlight, um, you have very very well-meaning uh, people there, and and so it, I don't think that those should kind of those people should all be maligned or painted with um, broad brushstrokes, uh, but. And the reality is that we're now at this time where science and research has been has become this major issue of tension between the two countries and, and technology, of course, with Huawei. Um, we have time for one more question. Make it a good one. And let's have somebody from the other sex. Yes, we've been all men. Okay, here we go. Uh, microphone, please. This young woman here. Hi, the name is Jody Krisiloff. Um, I had gone to a lecture by some uh, law enforcement people a couple of years ago, and there was someone from the FBI who mentioned a situation like this. But mm -hmm. maybe it was a different incident, or maybe it's just the FBI perspective, because they said, first of all, the FBI didn't know anything about this, and mm -hmm. they got a call in the Baltimore office, and some farmer had called them and said, uh, oh, there are some uh, Chinese in my cornfield stealing corn. And... Um, they, they, and the FBI said, the response was, well, why don't you call the local sheriff? Because 
This has mm -hmm. nothing to do with us. If it's property theft or whatever, just, just you know, call your local sheriff. Yeah. And supposedly the farmer said, well, you don't understand. You know, out here we grow special seeds for Monsanto and DuPont. Oh. And then apparently the FBI person said, oh, this sort of woke them up and they sent the agents out there. And they claimed that there had been uh, several people escaped with the seeds, got back to China, and that DuPont and Monsanto lost millions of dollars because mm -hmm. the technology was stolen and that they had only arrested, I think they had managed to arrest one or two people. Yeah. Now, you mentioned there have been a number of these incidents. Mm -hmm. So is this so one of them? Those, or Some of those details are the same. Some of those are different. Yeah. Than, so well, I'm that, that's sure. what I'm wondering. What, Was this I the mean, FBI this perspective? This started so, yeah. the way this case started, as I mentioned, when the FBI agent visited DuPont Pioneer and said, have you seen anything suspicious at the same time like within a span of two weeks there's a farmer in Iowa who owned who owned this field that he contracted out to Monsanto <coughs> he saw this guy trespassing in his field he he himself called the local sheriff's office because I talked to him and his wife uh, worked for the sheriff's office um, they sent out this alert so all these squad cars show up at the cornfield, and Robert Moe is driving the getaway vehicle, and they pull him over. And <coughs> that was, that, that's how the um, case developed. It's kind of the there dramatic have, opening there, of the book. There, 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 there have been other cases of brought involving agricultural espionage, um, and there were two others involving Monsanto, specifically. But are these separate incidents, or are some of them related to some of the I've never heard involved? of the Baltimore. Because that would be interesting, too, if it's I, not just an isolated yeah. incident, but somehow they're all linked. And maybe there's yeah. a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. <laughs> you want to address it? Is there a conspiracy I, of corn theft? Um, <laughs> I have in my <laughs> hand a list of known corn, you know. <laughs> yeah, the other cases involving Monsanto um, have involved um, like technology for monitoring corn of uh, monitoring fields. Um, there, there's one. There was a, a guy charged in uh, November, or December, um, and and that was involving some kind of climate analysis technology. Hmm. And it was that Sherry Chen, definitely right. Uh, weather analysis. Right? Yeah. No, it was yeah. another Monsanto right. case. Um, hey, yeah. thanks, folks. Yeah. Let's hear it one more time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mara. <laughs> Get the book. It's right back there.